Um, so look, th thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, we actually have 270 people registered for this. It's our biggest registration to date. Um, so if you could manage to keep your, your microphones on mute here for this, it would be fantastic just to let Mickey get his, his presentation done. It's a bit of a different and, and in my opinion, a very valuable format this week. Uh, Mickey will be presenting on scenarios that a lot of you had requested prior to the webinar um, when I sent out the wee forms link. Uh, and he'd be using the experience and techniques he's gathered through the years to give us a step-by-step -step guide and, and even a bit of an insight as to how he actually coaches the game to his teams. Um, for anybody that doesn't know Mickey, uh, Mickey's been involved with many successful teams uh, from an All-Ireland winning Camogie Rossa team um, to a more recent Dublin Senior Hurling Championship winning Bally Bowden St. Andrews. I actually had to talk him in to doing this tonight. He's not the biggest fan of webinars himself, um, so we're very grateful that he, he, he's agreed to do it. Mickey, over to you. All right, no, no bother. Thank you, Anton. Um, so look, just while I bring up the available presentation in a minute, I'm conscious, um, I know from speaking to people and even from listening to the odd one or two of these, I'm kind of conscious that a lot of people come off these um, and they're nearly more apprehensive about coaching. You know, so many people come on and want to deliver a webinar and it's full of fancy terminology and jargon and all these big long words that makes us doubt ourselves. You know, I even, I've met loads of people. I remember actually an experience when I was early starting coaching and I'd asked the coach one day, how, how do you, like, what are you doing to develop speed? And he was telling me about it would be the second phase of our interval training and our plyometric build. And it was just a succession of massively long words that made me walk away pretending I knew. Oh, ah, yeah, that sounds great. Because I never want to admit that I don't know. And I had never a clue what he said or what he did. And even now, I would still see him about at times. And he's maybe coaching a lot of years and, and he wouldn't have won a big pain. And I just think too often we allow people to put ourselves and make us doubt ourselves about what we're going to do and how we're going to coach. So with that in mind, I know you're all on mute. At any stage before I move on, if you're not sure of anything, or you want to pull me in something, or you want to ask me something, take your 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 mute off and ask the question. You know, this is for you. This isn't about me trying to say, oh, look, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do the other. Everything I'll talk about tonight, you're either doing it, or 100% you can do it. It's actually extremely straightforward and very, very simple. Just gets down to the question of if you want to do it or not. So as I say, anything you're not aware of or not sure, you stop and ask this. All I'm going to do now is go through some of the things that we would do, and you'll see that it has a repetitive nature in it. Um, so I'll just open the presentation here now for you. Unfortunately, it's not the Rossa Historical Society because I know they do good videos, but we'll see if we can get anything else done. Anyway, so what would what Anton had asked or what spoke about was about how to prepare for the games that are coming up. You know, so you see so many of us, and I, as a player and even early on as a coach, what you played and what happened in the match on Sunday and the team that you're playing the following Sunday will bear absolutely no relevance to the training you're doing. And then you find yourself on a match day roaring and screaming about everything that's happening in front of you, when realistically you've had chances to plan and prepare for these. So, sorry, Anton's asking me, is that flicking through okay, Anton? Yeah. Okay. So, let's look at scenario, scenario one. I'd asked Anton as well for, for you to give us some scenarios that you've, you'd you want to deal with or that you've seen have arose over the years uh, or as a coach or as a player or even stuff you've seen in TV and give us that challenge on how, you know, we would go about um, setting up to play against it or break it down. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at, and, and it's going to be the same situation. So the situation simple, and we've all been there. We played a championship match on a Sunday. We won, and we've now next round two weeks later. So what does that two weeks look like um, where we are, okay? So the first thing, obviously, then your next is you're out on your Tuesday. And what we would do then is we would run an analysis session. So we would have the game videoed, and we would generally get that video back Sunday evening. Um, between the management team would watch it, and the, and the analyst would, would pull things out of it. But the session on Tuesday, you can see one of the interesting bits here, I think. We only bring in the people who have played. You know, so if you haven't come on as a sub um, in that game, 
you're not expected to be there. Now, you can come if you want, um, but you're not expected to. The simple reason being is, again, from talking to players, players are annoyed when they're not starting. Then they're even more annoyed when they give up their Sunday to not even get on. And then why do they want to sit through 15, 20 minutes of analysing something that they weren't even part of? So we don't make it compulsory, but as I say, it, it is open for them. Um, and there, once it's not compulsory, then we can't really go into too much detail on what we're going to do or how we're going to do other things. So what we analyse for that 15, 20 minutes prior to training is ourselves. So we would have things that we would be looking at, you know, our freeze conceded, where are we conceding them? Is there a pattern evolving out of it? Our shot selection. So, you know, if we're looking to hit a shot percentage of, let's say, 80% or 70% efficiency, and we're only getting 65, you know, we're having a look at them shots and we're seeing well, where they're coming from, where the wide's coming from. Um, I remember actually a situation before in Dublin where we didn't make our shot efficiency. And when we dug into it, the shot efficiency actually, we brought the forwards in for a meeting and we looked at it. The forward shot efficiency was about 79, um, 79 80. But the problem arose because we had six defenders with pot shots from 70 yards, all that way, and all the end brings. So it's cumulative, and we're looking at them type of things just about ourselves. So we're not worrying about anything else. We're not looking to delve anything further. Just that 15, 20 minutes, we'll analyse what we did on Sunday. So we know how we wanted to play. We know how we wanted to set up. We know how we wanted to use pockets. And we look at some of them areas and see, obviously, constantly what needs improved. Okay? After that, then we move into the session and we'll have a split session. So those that played um, for a 45 minute period or more. So if you come on the last two minutes, you don't get to fall into the active recovery group. And um, so those that played will just do an active recovery, like a light enough session. You know, plenty of shooting, plenty of touch, plenty of stretching. S and C might take them for a bit of a light jog. I, I, you know, do what they do. I never really get too bothered with S and C people. Um, and it gives us an opportunity as well to give some individual feedback. So whether that will be through the iPad or just through communication, you might get some of the players then get that avenue of saying, Mickey, look, it showed up in the analysis. Um, that I didn't do this, will you look at me to do it? And it gives you that chance of two, three, four, five minutes to have that conversation with players. Um, and maybe I actually should have pointed out, our Tuesday analysis session is actually run by the players. So we will identify two or three players on Sunday evening and they'll be contacted and they'll be told, you know, Anton, I want you to look at freeze conceded or, you know, Mickey, I want you to look at, at puck outs or Paul, I want you to look at the use of uh, possession. And the reason we would do that is, we probably identified that Anton gave away a lot of frees or we gave, we've identified that Paul um, didn't use the ball well. And really, it's a kind of a self-reflective thing. So the, the job then will be for Anton to go and through the video, pull up the times of his frees and let our, the analyst know who then create the video. And then he'll talk to me prior to that Tuesday evening about what the message is. You know, it's not just somebody winging it. Um, and we'll make sure then that all the messages are, are in line. Um, and then, so back to that session then on Tuesday night, those that didn't play, they need to get their distances up. You know, there's no point in having, I remember doing a thing before, and something I'll be very keen on, is, you know, there's no point getting in the championship with a mismatch of minutes played. And what I mean by that is we generally go and play our players. And okay, when you get the championship, you're picking your main team every week. But during the course of the year, we will look to get lads as game time equal as possible. So the best player in the team may play every game and then if you think about it if he if he isn't going well in championship and i take him off to replace him with somebody so by the time we get the championship anton star man center forward has played 850 minutes and it's not going well for him so i'm now going to need to replace him with mickey who has played 130 minutes you know already i'm meant to be a weaker player and now I've only got an eighth of the minutes that Anton's played. So we would make sure throughout the course of the year, we try and keep people's minutes up as well. So that may mean plenty of challenge games on a Tuesday night um, in order to make sure that, OK, I didn't play at the weekend, but I'm still getting 50 minutes on Tuesday. So by the time we get to the following week, I'm maybe only 10 minutes down on what our starters are. Um, and so within that, then you're looking at getting your distance and all up. And Tuesday, then, as I say, becomes very much about us making sure we get ourselves right, making sure we look at our game, making sure that lads who need game time or need males in the legs or need a bit of contact, uh, and they get all that. As we move through into Thursday, um, now we start to analyze our opponents. 
and we look at their key players, any puck out trends, any discernible systems. You know, we, we, we talk about what they might try and do on us when we look at their strengths and weaknesses. What could they do to hurt us? We will always have somebody in our management team whose job is to look at us as if he was coaching against us and he can give us where he sees where our weaknesses would be so we, we can we can guard against them as well. Um, we look at potential mismatches. As you'd imagine, you know, we, we would look at these through the video, through the stats and stuff that's all coming back to you, and we'll see, you know, who's their scores, how much of the score from play, how much of the score from freeze, where they're scoring from, and we'd pull all this information together and we look at it as a full group prior to training on Thursday. Now, you know, it's also worth remembering on Thursday, this will be the players' first time seeing this. But as a management team, we will have been in through this and putting this in place from Sunday. So we'll be using that to plan our Thursday session. So we know. So one of the things we'll be highlighting in the meeting on the Thursday will actually be what we're going to train that evening. OK, so as I say, for the benefit of this course, one of the things that had come back in um, one of the things that had come in from um, yourselves was about how to combat a sweeper. So we we'll take the sweeper and um, we would experience this in a actually in a Dublin semi final last year we came up against um, this and this and this is sort of how we ran through it. So we, we first of all we look at the sweeper. You know what is his characteristics? You know is he is he strong willed? Is he strong minded? Will he wilt under pressure? You know you got to get a feel for these type of players and obviously you know that would be Dublin but you know up here there's no way a St John's man doesn't know. The Rossa team and doesn't know the St. Gaul's team and doesn't know the Lucky team. We all know each other very, very well. So you're insane into there. You'll have that naturally anyway. But in this situation, they played a sweeper who sat back in the pocket, just protected their full back lane. Was their main outlet for starting the attacks? Um, was their best ball player? Uh, they looked to him for puck outs, etc. And then they shaped the other team around it where they played two up top and brought the half four lane out to midfield. And um, they were quite happy to leave our cornerback free. Now I'm guessing that everybody has experienced that or seen that. You know, it's it's kind of a, a run-of-the-mill situation with, that you'll face regular enough. So looking at it in that situation here, um, as we see it, you know, you, you're just looking at, at, at that, you know, and it's probably as simple as that. I don't know, is that graphic working as an Antoine? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. you know, they're pulling that. Now, that sweeper can come from anywhere. You know, I'm just taking them from corner forward. They can drop them from midfield and you'll find then they're dropping a half forward to midfield and so on and so forth. But generally what's happening is they're bringing somebody back into play in that area. Um, which will, Then they're pushing the two men inside, pulling the lads out to midfield, and they're happy then to leave the corner back sitting free. Um, and obviously they're trying to isolate this space, what they can use for their attacks, while also crowding their um their own area trying to stop our attacks so we would we would go through an, an exact same graphic as this it just sort of makes it visual for the lads you know and, and they can see exactly what we're talking about and, and you're trying to take out as many surprises as possible over the course of the game so you know when we look at that then what we'll do we move into thursday session then so we know what they're going to do we've got a look at how to play a sweeper thursday session then is an in-house game session where we play different ways to look at how we combat a sweeper. So we play a 10 minute session, a 10 minute game where we let one team play with a sweeper and we don't do anything in the other team to counteract it. All right. Um, we also wouldn't necessarily just play our A team against our B team. You know, if we want to highlight how dangerous the sweeper would be, then we maybe put our best ball player in there so he can do all the damage and you can see that we maybe put our two dangerous full forwards up on top to, to make it completely evident as to why we're doing this um, I'm happy enough to make a question on which we could leave it to the end you know why do we do this like why would we do nothing and the simple reasons why we do nothing is players always carry bravado you know you tell a team they're going to play a sweeper we need to stop the sweeper their automatic reactions. No, we don't. We'll play our own game. You know, and, and I saw now Corcoran was saying in this, I don't know if he's on, but I know like when, when Leash had beat us, that was a big problem. You know, we identified that Leash was playing a sweeper and we just refused um, to stop it. You know, and, 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 and like essentially they're setting up to play that way. They're going to want to play that way. And if we allow them to play that way, let's see the damage that that can do to us. So the first 10 minutes, by doing nothing and just playing our own game, we're kind of highlighting to our players this won't work. 
you know, this won't work over a period of time. And we're happy to embrace not working. You know, not everything has to work. Uh, and as I say, discuss. So it's a 10 minutes game. And as I say, discuss at the end, we'll pull both teams, blue and red team, come in together and we'll discuss how did that work? Where was that? You know, well, that's the blue team. How did you find that? Where, where did you get the joy? Where did, you know, likewise with the red team, where did you struggle? You know, how did you find coping with the extra man? What about our extra man? It's not a 30 minute discussion by any means. It's a quick two, three minutes. And then we move on. So, as I say, looking at that, that's simply how we'll do it there. Look, that man will probably drift across the middle and we'll just play the 10 minutes that way. The next 10 minutes then, after the discussion, we move in where the other team pushes up on the sweeper. So now we're not going to allow them to play free. So as our situation was here, we're not going to allow them to just sit and dictate their sweeper. So we're going to push our man up on him. Now, obviously, somebody's going to say, but geez, you wouldn't be sending your corner back up there. But that's actually for a different um, scenario, believe it or not, later on, where we'll push somebody who'll push somebody, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But for this situation, what we're saying here is, well, we're not going to allow your sweeper to set free so we play the game we push somebody on the sweeper and straight away i'm sure you can see look at the space that's opened up all right so look at you know straight away we're looking and saying you know this is dangerous here we've opened up 40 yards of space 50 yards of space right in front of our goals but as i say we play the 10 minutes we'll see how it goes and again then we come in and we'll discuss briefly strengths weaknesses how it compared to the last day the third, the third, the third block then that we play is that push and drop situation. So again, the, these scenarios would have came from the management discussing them from Sunday evening on, um, on how you know what are our different scenarios, and there may have been ten or twelve on the on the play at this stage, and we whittle them down, whittle them down, whittle them down. These are the four that we look at in depth. So the third one we're looking at here is the push and drop situation. So as it was before, with the sweeper sitting back there. And we just push the man on. So he pushes the wing back, wing back pushes up the wing forward, and he pushes on in there. Um, and likewise, as that's our push, obviously the next thing comes our drop. All right, so we're pushing and dropping. Now with this situation, something that we had, we had identified, when do you push and when do you drop? You know, if we put that out to the many people are on, you probably find half say, oh, you push when they have the ball, and you drop when we have the ball, and the other half might say different. You know, if you push when they have the ball, then you're opening up the space. And if you drop when they have the ball, then you're freeing up their sweeper. So it's kind of a catch-22, even though it sounds brilliant. And on a graphic, it looks it looks fantastic. And these lads pushing, it, it, we, we found this was very, very um, awkward to do because essentially here as well, in this wee graphic that makes it look lovely, none of the blues are moving. So it's easy to push and drop. But all of a sudden you get in the match situation in real life and movement. You know, the wing back on this side that you're pushing on to, he's maybe over on your side after tracking somebody. You know, do you have to run all the way over there? And run? So it becomes very messy. And again, we this was one that we had tried in training and it ended up in rows, which was great because it meant when you that's not what we're doing, we'll just throw it in the bin. Um, and then the last one that we looked at was the, the situation where we will decide who the free man is. So, okay, you're going to play a sweeper. So you're going to have an extra man back there. We accept that, but we're going to decide who that is. So, you know, you, you're, you're going from this situation where straight away, the first thing that I'm sure most of these would change would be you get that marker in there to mark and you drop your own ball player back to play in that space. And likewise, as much as they have maybe decided to free up our cornerback, we have also well have identified who in their fallback line is going to cause us least damage. And we will allow that man then to go and pick up the sweeper. Now, with with that in mind, it also looks very, very simple. Just pick up the sweeper. But it's actually quite difficult, I've found over time, to get that mindset right with that player. That player has to be a special type of player. That player is not your scoring corner forward. Because the minute that the ball goes any way up front, he's going to run looking the ball. And ultimately, what's he doing? He's freeing up the sweeper again. Um, even I think uh, colleagues on here I remember last year actually getting into the Ballycastle game with a player detailed to pick up their sweeper and you nearly found you spent the first 15-20 minutes roaring stay in the sweeper, stay in the sweeper stay in the because it's not a natural thing to do if you think of two phases of play first phase of play being when you have the ball and you're about to deliver it in you know, okay so our wing back gets the ball and he's about to deliver it in I'm marking the sweeper at that stage, brilliant he delivers that ball up the lane I go run and look on that ball. 
they win it. The second phase of play now, they have the ball, and who's marking their sweeper? Nobody. You know, it's been a completely useless exercise. So it becomes a very, very disciplined situation in making sure you shut down that sweeper. Remember, go back to one of the earlier slides. Why is he their sweeper? Because he's their best ball player. He's their best deliverer of a ball. He's their best vision. He's the best use of the ball. So they want to get him on the ball. So it's our job to make sure we shut him down. Um, can I, I can go back to um, Dublin semi-final last year? It was actually a close call between one or two corner forwards. And because they played the sweeper, one of them corner forwards had actually played this man marking role, for want of another word, in previous games and done it well. And straight away, then he gets the nod because we know he has a role to fulfill. And two things then worth thinking about. What is the cornerback now that's free going to go, going to do? <laughs> if you actually think about it, nine times out of ten, he's just going to follow that corner forward. And that corner forward is essentially going to shut down two men by himself and open up the space in that pocket. It also means that you're pushing a weaker corner back to become their deliverer and their, their setup of attacks. So it allows us it allows us then to start pushing our cornerbacks out in front of their corner forwards and starting to close that space because we know the delivery isn't going to be as good coming in. And after a while, them two blues are going to come out to meet them two reds and the Reds can push another two or three yards and slowly taking them further away from the goal as they go. So after going through the, the different scenarios, and we'll have worked 10, 12 minutes on each of the scenarios, no more, um, and we'll have a discussion. Possibly after the game, yes, you would be speaking, management would be speaking, obviously, um, regarding what ones they think are the best. You'd be getting a feel for some of the lads, but you kind of know by how they work what one suit is best. So heading into Saturday then, you're working with two of them. So you're going to go into a 20-minute game, working with plan A, and then you're going to have a bit of a break, and you're going to go into a 10-minute game, working with plan B. And you also, at times, will have one of them as a plan C. You don't need to run through it, but you'll speak about it. You know, Remember the one we did third on, on, on Sunday, or on, on Thursday? If we need to, that's what we'll go. You know, it'll be touched on, and lads will have had a run at it. Um, and, and again, the reason being is, just landing their match and trying to adjust that or trying to tell people where to push and drop, that's when your stress levels are up through the roof. That's when you're making no sense. That's when lads are switching off. So when you come match day, lads aren't taking much in. So you have to have all this prepared ahead of times. So on the Saturday then, war after the warm-up, obviously, straight into the game. 20 minutes, play. Bit of a break. Any Anything stand out, any change. Into the plan B. And then again, you know, having a, a discussion after with the players, you know, some of them will want to know what if he does this and what if, and we don't put any stipulation on the other team playing. We don't tell him you must play here as a sweeper because we don't have that opportunity come the day of the match. So if somebody who's playing on, let's say, the blue team there decides as a sweeper that he wants to bomb forward, then we let him because that situation may very well arise the following week. And how did the Reds deal with it? After that, uh, at the end of Saturday session, we go into small scenarios. Um, and this is for players just to learn and, and, and self, self-motivate self and actually they, they become um, coaches themselves. So, you know, we give them a scenario, we line the two teams out. We're not necessarily telling them we're playing sweepers, we're not playing sweepers. We line the two teams out, we'll have one um, part of management team look after a blue team, one part look after a red team, and we line them out. And we'll tell the blue team, for example, you're two points down and there's five minutes left. And we will referee it four or five minutes and you know some of the things you know likewise then you know you might tell me seven minutes these are seven minutes before half time you're four up what are you going to do and, and the learning that happens in these things is incredible because i remember one situation um the two points down the last five minutes one of the lads in gets a ball at wing forward and he beats his man he's 50 yards out and he decides i'm going to keep running here and in front of him, there's a centre back, there's maybe a sweeper, there's a full back line, and he keeps running, he keeps running, he gets to about 25 yards out, and he lets flat the net, and it's saved and cleared up. And the rest of the team at him after the five minutes was up. And, you know, it didn't take the coach to do it. They saw it, what it needed him for, take your scores. We were two down, we needed to go one down. You know, can't force the goals. Likewise, you know, seven minutes before half time, you're four up. You know, Messi's now probably coming out of that. At the very, very minimum, we must go in for up, you know, so don't be conceived. And the players pick these up and learn them themselves without you having to stand and write and show. So all of a sudden come match day, um, 
came in five minutes before half time, you're letting the lads know we're three up, we're four up. They now no one can switch into that mode. We mean we make sure we maintain this or we add to it, but we definitely don't concede, you know. And as I say, these scenarios there'll be different scenarios every week. You know, so over the course of a season, you'll build up scenarios um, that you become comfortable with, and then you can go back and touch on them um, again as, as as they arrive. Tuesday, then we go back to about us. You know, we 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 work on our plan and we look at transition work. And what I mean by transition is how we're getting our scores, how we're creating moving from defence and the attack. So we look at that drill based initially. So that might be. Somebody at wing back with 40 balls and somebody at full forward, a group, sorry, at wing back and a group at full forward and a group at wing forward. And simply I'm coming, picking the ball at wing back and delivering it long into the full forward. His job's catching it. And as he's catching it, the man coming in offload. And we'll just create that pattern, create that pattern. We could be switching the ball. We could be building it through lanes, feed the half forward, midfield breaking through. And we'll just look at creating these patterns that lads get comfortable and knowing. And what you're trying to teach them then is in certain situations, what angle of run is best? What's the time of the run? What's the distance they run? You know, lads that are arriving far, far too early, you know, you need to be bringing your, your run out or you need to be starting it later. And they start to pick this up from these positions. Now, obviously, a wing forward driving at the goal is going to be a different one from midfield. They're going to have a different length of run, a different angle of run. And then we can start to add two, three different runs in at the same time in the full form that we has to decide who's the best option, etc. So, as I say, the Tuesday is completely about us um, and very much drill-based initially and just looking to see um, what we can do and how we can do it. We would then move in to, again, some scenario work, but we're looking at goals. You know, the game is always about goals, and we would talk to them all the time about goals, goals, goals. It was actually a thing I'd heard Eamon O'Shea talk about before, where they don't have a maximum amount of goals, but they have a minimum. You know, they're aiming for two goals a half or whatever. You know, we we try to incorporate that, you know, because you think of the amount of times you drive through a goal, and when that door gets shut, your point's still there. You know, take your point and get out and go again. Um, and even from the fact of going at goal, you're constantly asking questions. You know, so if I get fed a ball and I win it and I turn and I'm 30 yards from goal and all I have between me is me and a cornerback and I pop it over the bar, well, the cornerback's delighted because realistically he was in big trouble there. But because I just wanted the point to what to be in the paper or what my name was said, some Twitter, not one, you know, we haven't actually asked that defender a question. Now, if you think if you get five balls and a half and you take him on five times, in order for him to get that clean dispossession or clean tackle, what's the chance of him getting that five times out of ten? And the, the twice that you get by him, you're in on goal twice. And the twice he pulls you down, you have two points anyway. You know, so it's trying to get that mindset. And we would use that on a Tuesday a lot of time at going for goal, going for goal, whether it's route one and feeding off or whether it's a running game or whether we're using that creation of space by dragging men out. But we're trying to get that in our mindset. And then as we move through to the Thursday, so game day now is, what, two or three days away? And um, we move through to Thursday. We lighten the load, but we definitely don't avoid the contact. I remember watching um, a documentary on the on the All Blacks, and they were famous for not for not winning two or three rugby world cups at the shooter one. And what they talked about was on a Wednesday they had had a captain's run, which was a late just a late session, and then they maybe took a Thursday off and then recovered, you know, a late bit in the fr- and a game on a Saturday. And when they looked at it, they were getting into games having not done anything in you know 48, 72 hours. So we still look to add a bit of contact in. Now, they might be reconditioned games. They might be sort of get out the gate games. They might be a bit of, you know, backs and forward type, attack and defend. And we would break them up into small, small manageable portions. So it'll be like a three minute burst. And then we go back and, and, and work on our shooting again and go back and do another three minutes. And then we'll come out and do our tackling technique. And we'll go back and do another three minutes. And we'll go and do our goal finish. And we'll just break the session up that way. That, you know, between each exercise, we'll still get a wee bit of contact. And by the time the session's over, we'll have done nine or 12 minutes of contact just to keep the body up and going. And then that brings us then forward in the game day. And there's no need for me to be standing in dressing rooms or Mal or, or Kurt, whoever it is, saying, you know where you're going, do you know where you're playing, do you know what you're doing, you're marking it. It's all done that week, which means if something arises in the middle of a game, we like to hope 90% of the time we've thought about it, 
we've talked about it and we've planned for it. And by having them three things done, it all of a sudden takes away the craziness on the line. Here, do you see he's over there? You know, we've all been there, we've all seen it. Um, you know, the screaming and the shouting and the roaring. And it's only we're only doing that because we're seeing this. We've never thought about it before. This thing's now in front of us. We're having to lead 15 men to counteract it. And we have actually let them down because we haven't done the work to plan for it. Um, so Anton, I'm going to come out of this now. Um, so that, as I said, that's just how we would go about in, in that format for dealing with um, a sweeper. So has anybody any questions or anything they want to say or anything that you don't agree with? or or and, and, you know, as I said, this is about you. So anything you want to know or I might know the answer, but somebody else might in here. Anton took everybody's names off, so I can't even pick on anybody. I don't even know who's here. Right, quite group, right, Mickey. Right, right. Yeah, what, what about, Mickey, the, what about the kind of attack and sweeper that really goes through midfield for scores as well? Um, what would you do to, to pick up that person? Would, would it be that man marker? Would it be your corner <laughs> forward or corner back? Getting into that game last year, that's exactly sort of the way their sweeper um, evolved. It's just you've got to track your runners, you know. So essentially what a sweeper is looking to do is create an overlap. You know, so if a sweeper then can create that first overlap. So if I'm a sweeper, whether I'm a centre-back, whether I'm driving forward, I'm running towards you at midfield. I'm looking you to commit to me and I can offload to my man that you're meant to be marking and now he's the next overlap and the next overlap and the next overlap so one of the big things we we would have detailed our half forward and particularly that man you must track your runner even if that means running 80 90 yards it means then that our defenders never face a two-on-one situation now that sweeper is never taken off with the mindset I'm going to drive 70 yards here and pop this over the bar because he's always looking for that overload. And if we're tr if, if 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 that man's tracking him, then all the rest of our men can stay with their own men. And remember, because he's up there, they've freed up a free man at our end. So he's happy to engage in then around 45. But the key to the whole thing is we have never give up an overlap. We'll discuss what's that. You're on mute, Anton. Would you discuss puck out situations in the three different types of games you play? Well, the next, the next, um, the next thing we'll go into is puck out. So we would generally work on puck outs over the course of the year. You know, so yeah, we would be, we would always be talking about what puck out would be best suited to what we were playing. Um, and I say so. So here that was. We can answer that in the next phase because that's the next thing that we're going to look at is puck outs and how they suit um, different variations. But you know your puck outs. Um, we, we would now even even when I talk about that uh, drill based stuff on the Tuesday evening, a lot of that originates with the puck out. You know, so that that might be the puck out to a cornerback who build it a wing and then deliver or a cornerback or a, puck or a goalkeeper pucking the wing forward in the midfield so it's all originating from that puck out so that they're getting that um touching base sorry on that um as well yeah great paul malloy have you have you a question there have you paul yeah yeah Anton, uh, mickey um interesting you're, you're talking about the push for players uh pushing up the pitch I'd, I, it's a good point i don't think there's enough uh, changing positions, um, you know, even regularly during during a match, because it confuses def defenders, and you know, after sort of three encounters, and you switch a player to the other wing or the the top of the right or top of the left, defenders get confused, and even 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 at times where you can change a, a man to two or three positions, I think that confuses defenders. And it's where you can't get scores because a defender usually analyzes who they're marking, their strengths and weaknesses after about two or three tackles. And I think that, that that's that's good. And it's a good point you made about pushing. But I'm talking about pushing across the pitch and pushing up the pitch. Uh, well, even and, and just a, a simple variation on exactly that, Paul. Sometimes we would play with two or three 
sort of we'll call systems. So and, uh, again, I don't want to talk shit. So I mean, what I mean by systems is simply, you know, we might play with three, three just orthodox, three full forward, three half forwards. We might change that to one full forward and two corner forwards withdrawn. We might bring that to three, you know. So and even just by doing that. You're keeping the opposition guessing the whole time, you know, because defenders defenders love getting comfortable. I remember sort of even finding that as a player. Defenders love it when you're just happy to play in that corner and I just to play in that in that zone. But if all of a sudden you're taking them out the field, or you're taking them across the other side, or you're taking and that interchange, you know, even even the talk about that two triangle, you know, the centre forward and the two two corner forwards and them rotating and the full forward and the two wing forwards and them rotating. So sure, even one rotation. And all of a sudden, you have six different people in six different positions. Um, we've all seen that. Actually, it used to be with Down, the Down Miners, the, the year they won um, Ulster, they had two lads, Miles and Diesel. And Diesel used to play up, the, you know, Owen Sands probably the only one sort of come through from that three. But they, Diesel and Miles used to play up top. And Miles was six foot two and let's just say big and strong for one to be politically correct. Um, was dynamite in the air. And Diesel was bit smaller and just lightning and quick and used to be able to actually you know it used to unsettle teams all the time swapping them because you'd have put you'd have put males in there and brought everybody else out and what was the natural thing to do should they have put a big strong full back on them dead on so you pull males out the wing forward where you can win puck outs and send diesel in and all of a sudden you have a big strong forward trying to mark somebody small and lightning so what what you know and what are they going to do they're going to swap somebody small and fast back and that just gives you the chance to keep swapping or keep swapping and swapping and the whole time and we would talk about it a lot particularly in the goals you've got to keep asking defenders questions you've got to keep asking if they may answer it the first nine times out of ten but the tenth time you'll get in Very good. Seamus Hughes, you had your hand up there earlier. Have you a question, Seamus? I have, yeah. Can you hear me all right? So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's it's a kind of, I suppose, it's more of a psychological one maybe than a team setup. Um, I was wondering, can you turn a team around during a game? You know, like your prep's been good, confidence is pretty good, and your team's battle-hardened, but come the big game, come the championship game, things just aren't going right and you can't put your finger on it and maybe your big players aren't performing. Is there something you can do there to turn that around? I, look here, I mean, it, it happens and we're all human. And I, I know that any situation that the majority of times that, that I've been in that situation, I've only thought about the remedy after we've been beaten at home, you know. So, I mean, you're talking things there, like how can you break the game up? How can you get a bit of a break in the game? You know, whether that's somebody getting down injured or whether that's, you know, you're taking time over puck outs, whether you need to slow the game down. Um, you know, whether it's a, a, a substitution that needs to be made. You know, even it's something that's that's been huge in the last number of years. I know, I know even I've seen Ryan there as well. We would have done it right bit with Middletown in the year that um, the one Ulster, where we would generally have held one or two players back who would be nailed on starters exactly for that type of situation where as things start to go stale and things start to there are certain players in every team and every club that when you see coming on a pitch gives the rest of the lads a lift you know well they may even come on and do nothing but they'll just give them type of lads a lift so so you've an avenue there in your team selection you know particularly when you think early on in, in a championship game and it's ding dust and it's banging and smashing and battling you know you have a real class act of a forward is it really worth having them in there if there's going to be no space and no, you know, n no movement for them and somebody can hang out of them and the game's very closed and and scrappy early on? You know, just you maybe have somebody that's pr prepared to go in and be a workhorse for them 30 minutes, 35 minutes. And then, as you say, coming after half time, your team's not really going well. Imagine the lift they get. Seeing one of your better players now warming up, ready to come in, and you know we watched it with Limerick won the first All Ireland when they did it with Dowling, and you see these teams now doing it. You, you know you, they talk about Dublin footballers and their bench. You know these players are getting the lift. So as a coach, you're probably looking at a number of things pre-game. You know your team selection in itself. Have you held something back just in case something goes wrong? Have you uh, anything built into your 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 style of play, or your game plan that you can change? to protect the defence if, if you need to? Have you anything there that you can kill, use to kill a game? You know, so they would be small strategies that you could probably look at. 
Yeah, no, that's no, that's there's some really good stuff there. And I'm sorry, I suppose I should have sent the question in earlier. I know it was kind of putting you on the spot. No, thanks very much for that. No, you know. Do you want me to go on the pocket, Anton? Or yes, Frank, you may move on the pocket, sure. And if anybody's any questions, they can even come back at the end again. Does anybody know if United started Lindelof? No, yeah, maybe a big, no, maybe no, a big fan. You see, Bali's Bali's in centre back. So it might bring me back to the start of this thing, will it? For similar game, I just wanted, and you'll see the repetitive nature of this. It's kind of, it's kind of problem or follows a program. Um, so we're back to this situation again. So the situation was we played the championship on Sunday, we won, and we play the next round in two weeks' time. Our Tuesday and our, our Tuesday analysis is about ourselves. Same again. Those people that played compulsory, those people that didn't play not compulsory, but again excuse me, more than welcome to come in and we'd be looking at this. So if you imagine this was the Tuesday after we played the last game against the sweeper, that would be some of our analysis. We would be looking at how we track the runners, how how many times did we create we allow them to create overload situations, etc. So we would we would dig in a wee bit on what we've just done. And obviously then we're still looking at our, our KPIs or our, our key things that we we'd be wanting to make sure we're doing every game, you know, conceding freeze, shot selection, use of the ball, etc. Um and then again, same Tuesday, split session, active recovery and skill based, low tempo with those that played. And those that didn't play get a full session, plenty of contact, getting their distance targets up. Um, and if, if possible, we can get a game. We take it every time. Um, moving into Thursday then, um, and the analysis of our opposition again. We look at their players. We look at their trends. We look at the systems. We look at any possible mismatches. And we start to question what can they do. And as a management team, we'd have been doing this Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Because remember, the Tuesday analysis is done by the players. And again, then for the benefit of this, we're going to look at a team that is strong in pockets. So when when doing these, I'm, I'm always thinking of, of sort of situations that we would have been in, um, and therefore it makes it relatable. So you know, but at the same time, not giving too too much detail. You know, we we, we come up against a team before that was uh, extremely strong half backling. You know, um, they were. You know, big, strong in the air, supported each other extremely well. They had won in all Ireland, I think, two years previous to this, um, with a similar same half back line, you know, big unit, um, all six foot plus, and we're all um just kind of knew each other. You know, you don't go two, three years and win things without getting to know each other and know the lads are playing with you. Um so we come up against this, and we'd also a caveat to that was that our um pocket retention stats weren't great. So we knew ourselves that we didn't win a lot of puck outs. Um, yes, you need to get out. Right. So we knew ourselves that we didn't win um, a lot of puck outs, um, particularly those rain down on top of them. So we knew just going and hitting the ball, you know, them 60, 40 or 50, 50 percentage ones weren't going to work. So we had to look and we had to think differently. So, you know, you look at this situation, you know, they were able to get their main round puck outs no matter where they went. You know, we went to the left hand side. You can see wing back attacking, midfielder coming across, wing back coming down. You know, likewise on the other side. You know, they're just and they're shuffling the whole time. And they're whole, the whole time they were closing down space. And you could see it in their games, you know, whether it was middle side, they were getting round bodies round that ball the whole time in that central area. And at the same time, also keeping your mind, we weren't good at winning them. You know, our, our, our stats for primary possession one and secondary possession one wasn't good. So we then would go in to look at pockets. And what we've done again, we would have had six, seven, eight, nine options on the table. And we'd have brought these then um, to the table uh, on the Thursday evening. So after the analysis, and we've shown the lads, and, and, and that would be shown through clips. We'd have shown them through clips in the games. Look, there they go again, there they go again, there they go again. See how they attack the ball, see how they get bodies around it. So, you know, you're making our lads aware 
um, of how we need to deal with. So the first sort of seven minutes are, and we go slightly shorter with, with puck outs because there's a wee bit more thinking involved. Um, we just do it as normal. So let me puck up, hit the ball and you've got to uh, attack and defend that ball. And again, we maybe put our, our, our starting half back lane on our starting half forward lane in that situation because that is the complete highlight of it. You know, that, that we can't, there's no point in putting our starting half forward lane out on our reserve half back lane and then winning 70% of the ball and thinking, here, we're okay to do this at the weekend. So we want to make it a, 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 as as relevant and as related as possible. Um, so particularly then when, you, when you're highlighting that, it's sort of showing, you know, maybe we're not winning the, the amount of puck outs that um, we would like to be. Um, and it highlights then within the game to yourselves, you know, afterwards, to, like it really, particularly when you have your own half-back lane, saying, sure, we won most of them. You know, it becomes very, very powerful in the fact that as a management team, we don't need to be pulling stats up, etc. You know, they're just seeing and expecting um, to do whatever they have to do um, to get it right. So we've discovered here, this is kind of used, the first one always when you do a free is kind of used to highlight, here's the problem. You know, there's, we're not solving the problem here. We're showing you what the problem is. So then we move in and we go a wee bit longer now once we get into the thinking end of things. So... What we're going to do now, one of the things we decided was we needed to break their half-back lane up, you know, because if they were allowed to just play across that lane and sweeping and covering, we needed to bring a shape to them that didn't suit them or that would create spaces for us. So straight away, we'd pull our two cornerbacks in, which then gives us opportunity. We're letting create a space then on the outside, and we can pull our two wing backs out, and as normal, our, our full back and centre back will split. So now we have options all over there. If any one of them blues don't follow a red, they're an option, and they know that. You know, every single player may, is made aware that well, this pocket routine might be aimed at the centre forward. Just because you're corner back, you're switched on because if he doesn't follow you, you're getting it. We then look to pull the two midfielders down, and they come down to the forty-five or so, or just just around the forty-five. And the reason being is their options. If you go any further than the 45 and you're heading on into the 21, the other midfielder's not going with you. You're not an option. You know, so you want to be an option in around that 45. And straight away, you can start to see the distance that's opening up around the other end of the pitch. And likewise, if somebody's going to make the logical question and say, but what if that midfielder doesn't follow him? If he doesn't follow him, then our midfielder gets the ball. You know, we get our primary possession out of that. Now, what we did then with the halfback line, we needed to break them up. We pulled our two wing halves right out to the sideline and midfield. Literally chalk on your boots. So right out onto the sideline and midfield. The centre forward pushes in towards the edge of the D where he's joined by the full forward. And the two corner forwards came tight in on the edge of the six yard line. Now, that's encouraging them. There's no way you're going to leave a centre forward just drifting in there and not mark him. There's no way the three full forwards aren't going to be marked. And ultimately what that does is that creates that shape. Now, if you can see the gap then between the wing backs and the wing forwards, and what we've allowed there is most wing backs aren't going to walk out and stand right out in the sideline with you. They're going to stand sort of five or ten yards in. They're going to stand five or ten yards in, and ultimately they actually become the target for the puck out. So we looked at bringing them out there, and remember these, remember the psychological end of it, we identified that these half backs were strong in the air and liked to get on their ball. So we put the ball right on top of her head. And it meant that all of a sudden the wing forward had a 10 yard or a five yard or an eight yard run, whatever it, be, it would be. And they're able to use that leverage then and use that opponent to get up for the ball. And it means that if they catch it, great. But a worst case scenario, if they're breaking it, think of where they're breaking it. They're breaking it inside. So you look at the space that we've created, okay? But when they deliver that ball, they're looking at breaking it inside where we have our two prong centre forwards. So if we just look at that again, midfielder, centre, centre, or the double centre forward, midfielder, centre forward, and wing forward, all on that side, all make the same run. So if that breaks inside, midfielder's coming on to it. If it breaks in behind, your half forward's coming out on it. And you get that break each time. And obviously then you can do that 
to the other side as well. So what we've done, we've isolated. Obviously, them the men are going to track and they're not just going to stand there, but you've created movement, you've created space and attacking space. So we needed to avoid the situation of standing on their puck outs, and now we've created that um, space where, where, where it's coming in. You know, even again, in that situation, you go down the middle and your midfielders coming off so on a, on a particular signal you know to change if they run for the midfielder you can go straight down the middle in the space that you've created and again it's movement we've created space and now we're able to attack the space with movement and like way saying once the ball's in possession you have men running and it's always great when you're putting up um analysis stuff to see your arrows driving at their goal you know, the more you're putting your arrows at their goal you know the, the, the better stand you're going to be in and um, likewise then you know because because we have brought another bit of the thinking, because we have brought our wing forward right out to the halfway line, obviously our goalkeeper can puck it further than that, but for maybe one or two that he just puts up on top of that defender's head, um, it brings that defender, it sucks him out the field. If that defender plays 10 yards further back, then we'll hit the wing forward with the ball if he's going to stand off him, but ultimately we can try and drag him out the pitch, and once he's dragged out the pitch, we can then go over his head, and if you see there, it's still the same runs. And all of a sudden, we're getting into the spaces in behind them. Um, and men are looking to drive on from there. Here we have the situation where our wing back was just let go. So we, whenever, because the wing or cornerbacks tuck in, you're able to use them channels on the side. So there you have a situation where the wing, the wing, their wing forward decided not to follow him down into the corner. So what's the point? Um, we give him the ball, and then straight away look at the options, look at the spaces that he can have. So if we're even using, you know, that our, our forwards are splitting, um, if he uses the switch ball across the one side, the whole pitch is open up, he can go sideline to sideline, or he can go straight up the line, and all of a sudden look what's created up the middle, all them spaces for our players to drive through and open up, all coming off space. You know, it's all about the creation of space for us, and uh, in the game that we did it, our ultimate aim was that we would get a lot of ball breaking off that wing back. But essentially, what turned out, our wing forwards actually caught a lot of ball that day. And it was just another step on. They just fed the runners coming through and, and, and so on. Um, a variation then, another one of the variations that we would have looked at was, uh, again, we've maybe done it 15 minutes, no more, of opening up one side. So remembering again our principles here, they have a strong half back lane. They win a lot of primary possession. They get two and three men in around the ball. We got to move them. We got to just, you know, we can't allow them just to sit and be comfortable. So straight away again, first three steps are always the same. Cornerbacks in, wing backs wide, and split your full back and centre back. And again, any man doesn't follow there, then he becomes an option. So full back to say he's not going to follow, or full forward to say he's not going to follow a full back. He's going to, then the full backs there is an option to the ball. Midfielders again coming in. And again, they don't come any deeper than that because they go any further in, they're null and void. They're running into traffic of, of, of 2v3, um, 30 yards from our goal. So, and their options, they're constantly looking at that ball. And the timing of that run is also very important when they're coming looking at that ball. And then what we can do, or what we can do, what we did do, is we sent our whole half four lane to the other side of the pitch. And we staggered them. So one of them might be around midfield, one on 45, one on 65. And we... We group our full forward lane in together in the full forward lane. And the reason being then, okay, you're going to mark them. And look what we've created. We've managed to create the whole space open up on that side. So the puck out's obvious where it's going here, okay? Um, so once we've created this space, then we're looking at that delivery. We're looking at the timing of runs. We're looking at the main moving, okay? And what I want to go back and do here, I just want you to watch them runs again two or three times. Look at the run. One man comes around the back and comes right into the space. One man breaks out to the 21 on the far side. One man is staying local. And the reason you'll see the reason in this in a minute. Okay, so there are three runs. Now, it doesn't have to be the same man makes the same run every time. But they're the three runs inside that we dictate. Okay. Now, obviously, they're not just going to do that all day. So the obvious thing they're going to do is they're going to leave that man back in that space. And what has that created? So if you look, if they've pulled him from the other side, we have now three on two over on the far side. 
Likewise, that man could be the midfielder that drops back um, and doesn't follow our midfielder to the 45, and then it's our midfielder that's free. It could be the centre forward that drops. Ultimately, what you're doing is you're asking them questions. But what I want you to do is watch again. So once it's an overload, we call that an overload on the far side. So we have three on two. The runs are still the same from the inside forward line. The runs are still the same. So the runs never change from the inside line because what that does with the puck out, we're actually aiming for that corner forward. So we're looking to put it as far and as long as we can as possible that the corner forward is attacking it and then we're all getting their runs off them. Is the MRs coming up for the runs in you? Yeah. Okay, so then it allows you to get the runs off them. But again, the beauty in that is the inside forwards, me and Anton and, and Ran, it's the same runs every time. Now, I might go to the corner, I might go to the far 21 one time. I might be the one that hangs around the score another time. I might step in front of your man the next time, Anton, to allow you to break out into this pace. But we're not, it keeps us active and keeps us ticking. Now, an interesting one in, in this then is why, even though it's an overload, does that corner forward still come out into the broken space? And essentially the reason being is he's coming out there to pick up that spare man because we don't want to leave that spare man. So he's making that run out. So if it breaks down, they're not sitting with a spare man in their own midfield. Um, and as we move on then, what we do there... Uh, you, you have someone with a question there, that's yeah, right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have Fergus there. Fergus, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, how's it going? Yeah, that's very interesting. Just say you were five points down, ten minutes to go, and they're playing one or two sweepers. Like, obviously, you have a free man in your own half, but then you have one or two sweepers that are going to, going to be counteracting the goal chance there. So, what's your line of thinking there? If, 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 what, what, if, uh, irrespective of what we're doing, if they're playing sweepers, they'll have freed men up. They'll have freed our, you know, it'll be our midfielder, our half back, or our, so we, it goes back to that. Whoever is free receives the ball, you know, just because we set, even if we set that up, Fergus, and the space is there, and we have a wing back free, you know, we give them the ball. You know, it's about course, getting yeah. their possession and building, and you know, and then obviously then it falls back into the other things of our um, scenario situations where we're carrying the ball, we're running the ball, we're, you know. So if you look there, if our wing back receives the ball in this situation, you know, look at the he's an ocean of space that he can carry. You know, we encourage our players to be productive and 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 you know they're not robots. They've got to think in their feet. So if they're dropping players back, they're freeing some of our players up. And they become the option then for the puck out. So then you're just running at them basically. Say it again. You're just running at them basically. And then you know that one of the best ways to beat a sweeper system is, is to run at them because they're generally you know they're looking for that break ball. Or it's very hard, and then it becomes a running game. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mickey. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry. So another one then we looked at and um, actually got this. Anybody wants to go back and look at Galway Camogie against Kilkenny two years ago. Um, I nearly would have put this down to go always winning the game. I thought it was a, a, a genius um, puck out on the day, and we would have looked at this for that um, that game as well. So you look at it was swamping the swamping their full back line or swamping their side their half back line. So I'm not sure if that is moving. Is it? Is that moving, Anton? No. Yeah, it is. Yeah, arrows and ball. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right, okay. So again, you, you, the situation here, um, they're lined out. You know, they're strong. We want to break them up. Want to unsettle them. So we look at on the puck out of the half forwards, all coming looking at. But the key to it is coming out the field towards midfield. Okay. So if we know our goalkeeper can put the ball onto the far forty-five, we are heading out the way past the 45. Two corner forwards getting as wide as possible. And again, going back to sort of Fergus point, anybody not followed there. So if the corner back stays in and covers the full back line and leaves him free, we give him the ball. If any of the half backs I, I didn't put it in the visual, but they would still all do the same where the corner backs tuck in, the wing backs go out. But we're looking at clustering that. And then essentially what we're looking at doing is putting the ball long over that. So you have the old style centre forward, if you want, move that ball on the air. The key that we want there is that ball must break them lanes and get in behind. And I'll just go back. If you see, the, the key personnel in this is the full forward. 
as the full forward drags out, drags out, you know, you want the full forward to be an option now, whether he maybe even goes left or right, but you want to get that full back out and the ball then goes long as the keeper can over their heads. If it's dropping in around that area, you know, you, you get them moving it on the air, back to the old style, um, move it on, whatever you want to do, get it into that and behind, and then you have your um your ability, everybody's in the front foot and they're all driving in that space and you only need to get in behind once or twice and you're in on goal. Okay. Saturday then, I'm not going to go too long then, Saturday we're back to our scenario work, we'll go 10, so if we've decided on, you know, for example, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an insight into it, I see Graham's in here somewhere so he'll probably tell everybody anyway, but we would have looked at the two of them being the separating of the halfbacks and then the, the overload. And the way we would have mixed that up no, in normal play, we'd have went just separating the halfbacks. But every time they had a scoreable free, so you think about they have a scoreable free, by the time he gets the ball and he sets it down, he takes his breath and he looks to see his, the cameraman taking his picture, that gives us time to get set up on the far side of the pitch and open the whole thing up. So we would have used that every time they had a free, it was brilliant to hit them back straight away. So then if we get a lovely point, and before we went bang, we get one back. We get one back. So we would have on the Saturday, we would have worked them scenarios, played ten minutes just with the plan A. Both teams play the same way, and that sounds a strange one, like. But if you imagine, if we line out, um, sort of this Saturday, you know, your scenario drill base work in the game of the Blues against the Reds, the red wing back marking the blue wing forward. And the blue wing forwards working as the blue teams working the the puck out strategy. The reds kind of learn nothing. So what we do is we flip them. We all play the same way. So if I'm right half forward in the blue team and you're right half forward in the red team, Anton, I'm marking you. So it means then that the red goalkeeper and the blue goalkeeper are in the same nets. So when it's blue delivery, I go out the wing forward. You become the red defender. And you go and you stand where you are, and with the, the four forwards inside, and with the four wing backs all marking each other, and it just gives you a scenario and a chance that you'll actually get the experience what your opponent's going to go through. So you'll start to think, hold on, I'm going to step back here, and then you actually start questioning yourself and you start coaching yourself. And then the flip side of that means, okay, after the blue reds up, you now become the forward, I become the defender, and you get the chance that all 30 men or 32 or 34, whatever you're using there, experience playing in the area that they're going to play there's no point in me putting you you know your wing back on the, on, the, on the red team and all you're going to do is experience what i'm doing you're never actually going to get to do what you're meant to do all of a sudden somebody's injured you're through into the game and you haven't done it all you've done is work against it so it gives us that opportunity when we're playing the same way um to get familiar with it and the iron inning out. And then again, the question, you, know, the, the, you would encourage plenty of conversation. Mickey, I'm going to stand here. Anton, do me a favour. Stand further away. Let me see. Anton, come and stand beside me. See what that's in. And you can actually start to mould different scenarios in your head. And you never know. One of them might appear on the sat on the Sunday. And that could be the winning of the game for you. Um, Saturday then afterwards, we're going to the management and players obviously decided plan A and plan B. And we play two 10 minutes, so two halves, 10 minutes with A and in-game coaching. So you're able to be saying, you know, Anton, you need to be further out. You need to be, you know, what one of the key problems with that was the wing forwards didn't come out far enough. So if the wing forward doesn't come out to the 65, then he's allowing the wing backs or the half back line to stay intact. You know, he needs to know to come out and the reasoning why and and, and, and you've all that coaching element going on. And then you would do two seven minutes of slightly much shorter, obviously, with the plan B. And likewise, you made a discussed a plan C of, you know, if we need to get a goal, we're going to go to the flooding of the half-back line. Um, Tuesday, when we go back, drill base nicely is back there attack. You know, once we have this shape, and now we know half forward are going to be playing slightly deeper, where is the attacking coming from? And you can see even through them pockets where the shapes and the spaces are coming from and how you can get men um, in on the ball, etc. And we'll do that drill based. And, and it will become, somebody asked earlier, that will come from our pockets. So that will come one hits five, five switches to fit, and the pattern. The pattern. We always try and find that pattern, you know, and, and by finding the pattern, what we're looking at is helping the wing forwards, midfielders, corner forwards, Time their runs, angle their runs, um, you know, combine their runs, you know, so you don't want two lads running the same lane. You want them to, so it, by doing a drill base and looking at patterns, it gives us that opportunity to do that. 
again, then we we'll move we can move into our scenario and based on um, scoring chances directly off puck outs, you know, so you can look even there, and I don't know if you were doing it at the time, but I know when I was putting this together and, and, you, and you're watching, you know, when 14 pulls away, look at the space he leaves behind him, if 10 made that run, he's in, you know, so you could start looking at that again from your puck outs, you know, going short, can you build for goals, going long, can you build for goals, find a midfield, can you find goals, and likewise, when the goals shut down, pop your point and go again, but it's always looking about asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. Thursday then is the exact same. You know, we go back into our touch, our goal finishing. Um, you know, we would have talked a lot about there's a big difference between shooting and finishing. You know, everybody wants to get inside 20 yards and open their shoulders. You know, we would look at a lot on finishing. You know, just making sure you get in, flick the rest, kick the ball, whatever it may be. You got to get in and finish. You got to get in and finish. And we interject every wee exercise with about a three-minute block of contact work to make sure that we're refreshing and then come game day there's no need for me to be standing saying Anton you need to be here and you, you need to and, and it also carries that that not threat threat's the wrong word but it carries that if you're not doing your job I know there's a wing forward sitting behind me who knows the job exactly and we'll move in and do that okay so that's presentation finished folks I'll come out and anybody wants anything far away is that right Anton Yeah, folks, any questions, feel free to fire them in the chat or or, or unmute yourself, whatever suits you. Like a lot of it, a lot of it probably sometimes sounds a bit deep, but like there's nothing that's been described there that you can't do. I just think as coaches, there's nothing that's, you know, analysis, you know, what is analysis, watching the game, pulling bits and pieces out of it, okay, you know, setting up, yeah, you've got to think, and no doubt every management team is three or four lads that are there that can bounce ideas off, or do you think this will work? And sometimes you got to put the herbrand idea out, and you got to run it, and you got to say, Jesus Christ, that doesn't work, because what you're doing then is, when you come match day, and you haven't tried it, and you, it's still in the back of your head, and something's going wrong, you go right here, try it, throw him up there, and then it doesn't work. You know, a match day isn't the best time to find out something's not working. Like, I'll ask you a question, Mickey, to get us started. Then, um, just I suppose it's it's still part of the coaching the game, and especially with the puck outs option too. But and Graham's here, maybe Graham Clark can answer a few questions too on it. But ultimately, if you have the goalkeeper there and his puck out isn't great, you know, and you you don't know whether or not you're relying on him uh, to be accurate enough, what what onus are you putting on either him? Or are you getting another player to come in and look at somebody else with a better strike uh, to take the puck out instead? Uh, and be the keeper. Be the keeper, sorry. I mean, be the keeper instead of him. Sure. You, you kind of got a deal and roll with that as it is. Like, I actually think back, uh, uh, like, that brings me out. I, when I, I took Anton Camogues 2010 and had three goalkeepers, and one of them could hit a ball, one of them could catch a ball, and one of them could stop a ball, but they all couldn't do it together. And, you know, you went through the whole season and you maybe played one, she made two great shot stops and next thing dropped one over her head. And then the other one came in and to put a ball 100 yards, but anything came near the net, just went in it. And, you know, and it went, I remember going on and on and on all year and, and, and Ronan was with me at the time and we were forever talking about, we need to change this, we need to change this, we need to change this. And we ended up playing an All-Iron semi-final. Um, and it was down we played and, you know, we played down earlier on the year and won by about 30 points. And, you know, you're expecting went in and the first ball within the first minute, they got it, launched it up, girl dropped it in the back of the net. And you just see the whole nerves and, you know, and we struggle badly. I think we only got a line by a point that day. And was it two or three weeks later, played the All-Iron final and dropped all three of them and played the full back of nets. Now, that could burn you. It ended up working brilliantly for us because the full back was, was, was fantastic. But, you know, it depends on if you have the time and stuff. Um, you know, like you, you're talking about I'm not massively convinced that if somebody hasn't hasn't got a long puck out, you can get you can get them a long puck out. I know what I've even spoke with her a lot of times in Middletown and um, with their keeper of trying to improve the length of puck outs. And then you're going down into bow mechanics and the height that he throws the ball and the way he swings. And you know, like if you're a manager you're getting into the team, that might take four or five years by the time he's getting there. You don't have four or five years. So you've you've a number of options, whether you look at somebody else doing nets. Or whether you look at creating a situation that I, I remember one of the first things that blew my mind, Ross of football, and we played somebody like Aldergrove or something, and they're a goalkeeper who couldn't kick a ball. And they used to just cluster 
at centre for at centre their centre back. Everybody stood round, and every single you know, whether it was a call or signal, one of the team they just broke away. And I'd say they had had ninety five percent kick out retention. We come in, you know, so they accepted. Right, he can't hit this far. So we'll create something here to make sure we're getting our players on the ball. Um, so there are your two options that I think anyway. Either find a way to create something that you can get your better players spaces and get them on the ball and um or find another keeper, yeah. Anyone else with any questions, folks? From the get-go, Mickey, obviously you're talking about championship there and you're talking about this championship game, but from the get-go, if you were taking a team from the start of the season, uh, and obviously you're going to have challenge games coming up and then you have league, traditionally you have the league and then traditionally you have championship after. When do you start your puck out preparation? Sure, when does it, it, it never really has a beginning or an end. You know, we will look at puck outs. So, I mean, there's three or four that are there now. I mean, we would create videos of their movements that you would see and the keepers would get that sent them and i mean it would be up to them to lay out their target areas and let them practice away it's a wee bit like the the old um karate kid where he was painting fences and and washing cars and he didn't realize that after a while all this fits in together so you know you could have them keepers just making sure they're hitting the target areas and and during drills you can make sure your forwards are making runs in and all of a sudden you'll start to, to, to put it together um as regards to digging down into it um we like to try and have a base of, let's say, 70% knowledge. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of good at 70% of things. And then we can become specific when we get the championship, you know, as opposed to starting to say on the 1st of January, this is going to be our puck for this year. And, you know, because all of a sudden what we do might actually suit the opposition. So you're sort of trying to talk and look at a variety of things and spreading it out um, and, and, and being able to delve into a large pot come championships over the course of, 10 league games and 10 challenge games and countless training sessions, you've done 100 different things, 100 different scenarios, and it means then when something comes up in championship that you know is going to happen in the next week or week after, then you can dig down and do a wee bit more. And they've already got maybe 60% of it, and now you're going to add the other 30 to it. There's no point in into the second hour if you're paying me by the hour here, like if they're all gone, I'm <laughs> having enough. <laughs> we, uh, just checking there then, if nobody else has any questions, just to, I know that this is probably the hour up for people that they were promised. So um, if nobody's got any other questions, we can we can move on. If you have any questions regarding puck outs, regarding the sweeper system, or even just other questions in general for Mickey about his team and, and his training sessions, feel free to ask. We'll give it another minute there, Mickey, and then sure. If, if there's no more, we, we'll shoot on. Uh, uh, Mary, just a, a simple question, probably reasonably straightforward. For people coaching juvenile teams, have you any drills that you would use for uh, novel drills for blocking and hooking? Maybe somebody else will feel that. I'm not the, the best of patience for juvenile coaching like but I still find that blocking and hooking um there's kind of no real substitute for playing small sided games in it because to create a blocking or hooking situation is nearly so false to do. You know, like you're you you want me to stand in front of you and you're gonna pretend to throw a ball up and pretend to swing and all of a sudden what you do then is you false you know there's a false swing there because you know I'm only swinging to get blocked here and, and then the whole thing sort of degenerates around. I wanna it was actually a soccer drill I saw before. So if you can picture four cones, um and there's three men on the outside, so there's one cone free and then a man in the middle. And what you're doing there is you can only pass in straight lines. So if I'm you know, let's say the red, blue, green and yellow cones, I can only pass straight line from red to blue or from red to green. You can pass in them too. So the man 
the, the, the free cone, it's up to somebody always to get that. And, and then you're, you're, the man in the middle lane is working then to get that block because at least he knows you're in game and you brought a wee bit of a scenario to it where you're, you're aiming. Um, you know, I, I know he's going to either strike to that blue cone or that green cone and, and it gives you a chance. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a nice wee one and sharp in the feet. Um, another exercise is just, you know, if, if, if you can pick to the 21 and we use this actually as a bit of a warm up because again, it brings contact. But if you pick the 21 and you have a cone, let's say a red cone, um, in line with the post. So if, you, if you're if you standing on the red cone facing to the side lane, you look to your right-hand side, you'll be in line with the post. And likewise, then, let's say there's a white cone um, in line with the other post on the 21 facing you, okay? And there's also then a white cone, let's say, five yards in towards the net in the middle and a red cone five yards further out the pitch in the middle. So all the forwards start at the red, all the defenders start at the white, and then the whistle. So I'm a forward, you're a defender. On the whistle, I have a, I have a ball. I have to run out to the red and then come through the middle and go for goal. On the whistle, you have to go into the white and then come and defend that area. And straight away then, you're putting it into block and hook and tackling situations. And at the same time, you're doing something that every kid wants to do. You're getting a shot at the end of it. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Damien, Damien, have you a question for us? I was just sort of following on what Mickey was saying there. What I find useful is that what people what would be known as the whole part whole coaching method. So after your warm up, without even briefing the kids, you may put them into a game where the rules are constrained that they're not allowed a solo run and they're not allowed a hand pass, and you just let them play, and then bring them back in and question them, how would you go there? And tease out the answer of, oh, Jesus, we need to be doing more blocking. And then that's where you go into those wee drills where what, what Mickey was talking about, and then put them back out into the game situation after that with the focus now on, right, we know we now uh, have to sort of focus on our blocking. Drills can be very, uh, you know, they're not at match pace. I find sometimes when you're doing blocking and hooking, the kids don't swing at the right sort of speed and stuff. So the very fact that you've put them into the game scenario first and showed them hopefully what it's like, then broke it down and put them back out again. I find that very useful anyway when, when coaching tackling. Thanks, David. Anyone else, any more questions, folks? No. Well, Mike, look, just to take the opportunity on behalf of uh, Anton GA and Gilfast to thank you very much for, for the webinar tonight. It was definitely something different in respect to actually getting to see what people do when uh, taking teams at the top level. Um, so for, for me, anyway, it was it was definitely very, very valuable. And I'm sure the feedback there, I'm just actually getting the emails across now about how much people enjoyed it too. So look, thanks very much again. Um, and hopefully we'll back get you back practical maybe practical base soon as well get you at some stage Holly says i'm not allowed to because i got some answers in championship <laughs> no problem thanks very much Mickey. okay oh yes thanks, thanks for having me thank thanks very Thank you.